Our next speaker is Graham Hunter. Graham has worked for six years as a research associate with the Center for <coughs> Water Efficient Landscaping at Utah State University. Uh, he has done this in urban horticulture and water conservation, and he is currently in the process of completing a, an MS degree in plant science at Utah State. He has worked 30 plus years in the green industry. Please welcome Graham. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have been in horticulture for a long time, and I realize I'm kind of the uh, going to take a little different avenue with native plants today, talking about. Uh, Ariagonum corymbosum as a ornamental plant in the landscape. Um, I have worked with Doug Johnson many years ago in Mount Remba in what was then the Crop Research Lab. Uh, when people ask me what I did for Mount Remba, I proudly announced that I was a pollinator. So I spent many hours with a toothpick in my hand uh, tripping alfalfa flowers. Let's see, I guess. Uh, Ariagonum corymbosum is a subshrub uh, that uh, exists in the, along the Colorado Plateau and adjacent areas. Uh, it populates foothills and desert zones. My objectives were to look at it as an ornamental in, in the landscape and its potential. I looked at both its tolerance to frequent and no irrigation, and I have evaluated it for p potential cultivars, which I'm going to speak about today. Um, water use um, has a lot of demands in, here in the arid west. Um, and if we just look at climate in the southwest, over the last 700 years we can see that uh, the fluctuations here were pretty great. Um, we can see here uh, this little glip in our uh, in the last hundred years of our very wet period that we've had is the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, where this severe drought here was the drought that most likely drove the Anasazi out of the Colorado Plateau, uh, but not Ariagonum corymbosum. Um, so traditional bluegrass uh, landscapes can use up to 60 percent of our available culinary water uh, just for watering bluegrass. Uh, that's northern Utah. I hope where you're from you're doing a little better than that. Uh, low water use landscapes uh, are made up of both native and adapted species which are genetically predisposed to survive in the, in, uh, the climates where we're raising them. Uh, so these plants will uh, contribute to water conservation which is really our goal in the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping at Utah State University where I work. Uh, plus, look, um, native plants can also contribute to the genus loci or the sense of our landscapes. What, what we want our landscapes to represent and look like. Do we want them to look like Scotland when we live in Logan, Utah, or do we want them to more reflect where we live? So my study, uh, was called Evaluating Ariagonum corymbosum's Significant Morphological Variations for Potential Cultivars, and it was a common garden study. And you can see from this photograph that there is quite a bit of uh, diversity here in both flower color and size. Um, the Ariagonum corymbosum complex is made up of eight uh, different varieties. We have um, Ariagonum corymbosum arium, which exists down here near St. George, uh, variety corymbosum, the eastern portion of the state of Utah and over into Colorado, glutinosum, central southern Utah and way down into Arizona. Uh, Niles the eye is this little tiny dot right here, uh, excuse me, Hylei eye. Niles the eye is uh, down here in the Las Vegas area, orbiculatum, southwestern Utah, the green uh, line here, Revillium in south central Utah, another very Tynum in the Four Corners region extending well into New Mexico and Colorado. Um, my collection sites uh, are indicated by the little star here, uh, this site near Duchesne, uh, 
this down through the San Rafael Swell, uh, Goblin Valley, Moab, the Burr Trail, Hell's Backbone, um, Tropic, and Henryville. Uh oh. We can do that. Excellent. And uh, so here we were in um, Henryville and Tropic to uh, Mount Carmel area, um, east of Zion, west of Zion, and over here in the Shibwitz area north of St. George. And I want to thank Mark Ellis for the use of this map. This is what he generated with his study when he was studying Niles the Eye for a protected a status as an endangered species. And he found that indeed it was a separate variety and, and, and has been listed as a protected species. Okay, I looked at leaf characteristics. Uh, seven of these char different characters here from length, width, pubescence, uh, foliage color, and leaf shape. And uh, honestly, these are very important characteristics when it comes to this plant's drought tolerance, but for its ornamental value, it's a little less important uh, only because this plant does not leaf out until very late spring. And in the early summer, it produces the flower stalks, which cover the leaves, and you really don't see them anymore. But the leaves have varied quite a bit. This is a species, Areogonum thompsonii, which I collected thinking it was a cornobosum, but it's a very closely related species. It has a larger leaf, over five centimeters uh, in length, and uh, oval-shaped, long petiole, compared to Areogonum cornobosum. Uh, glutinosum, which has a very narrow leaf, uh, narrow long leaf, and here is orbiculatum from over around Moab that has a uh, near round leaf. And like I said, the real importance here of the leaf is its contribution to drought tolerance. We can see here A is the width of the leaf itself, and B is the pubescence on the underside, uh, almost twice the amount of pubescence as, you, as leaf. And the upper side of the leaf, we can see that we do have stomates uh, at approximately, I think it was 71 millimeters, uh, 71 stomates per millimeter. And uh, we do have pubescence on the top as well, but it's not nearly as thick as on the bottom of the plant. But that varies from uh, variety to variety. And here's what we saw on the bottom of the leaf. Pretty hard to get a stomate count there, but we can be pretty sure that this type of pubescence is having a a uh, huge effect towards uh, uh, keeping this at a name, but it's open and somewhat sprawling form of the uh, variety glutinosum here, the yellow one. I also looked at size. Um, I went, for my data, I collected uh, the continuous data. I measured them all. But generally, you can say that um, this species is either um, approaches and surpasses 1,200 millimeters or they are under 800 millimeters. And so these top ones both will get up to 1,200 millimeters. This one is around 800. This tiny one here um, is really closer to about 300 millimeters. It's a very small plant. Here's an idea of what they look like after the flower heads develop. This is what they look like for the most part of the summer. Uh, this is the 800 millimeter Corombosum, and next to it is the little uh, bun plant that we call it. I looked at plant 
canopy density, and uh, I broke this down into four different densities uh, from the lightest density here and the Thomsonii, again to the bun plant with the heaviest density. The light density you can see through the plant uh, without much trouble, whereas when you look close at the uh, most dense one, you don't see very far. In fact, it's difficult to even push a pencil in there. You need some resistance. I looked at fall color as well, which is an important characteristic in the landscape because it, it this is the way the plant's going to look for the late part of the fall and through a good part of the winter. And so it does have winter interest. It's a, a very appealing plant. Uh, I decided that there were four uh, different fall colors. Uh, I've since learned that this has a lot to do with the density of the plant. The lighter plants drop their flowers and expose the flower stalks, and you get a lighter color to it. And then as the plant gets denser, it hold, even though the flowers may fall off, they still hang on the plant. And it's quite a while before they fall to the ground. And when they do, though, they'll look pretty much like this one, too. I looked at uh, the floral traits. I, I looked at five different traits, and the first one being color. I determined that there were three different colors. We have the white colored flower. We have the bright yellow flower of the uh, variety glutinosum. It's the only one, only variety that has this bright color. And then the pale yellow color of both variety Arium and uh, species Ariogonum smithii, which I also have in the study that I collected as a corymbosum. Another very closely related species that at one time was part of the complex. Uh, another other flora floral characteristics, I looked at the days and bloom. Again, our very bright colored yellow uh, glutinosum, 55 days of, of bloom. That's two months almost, uh, and that's a spectacular bloom on that bright yellow colored plant. Uh, the Hell's Backbone, 48, and you can see the different numbers until we get down here, where the one east of Zion, only 17 days. I also looked at bloom dates. Uh, and in the ornamental field, this is uh, very important because you don't see very many plants that don't flower until the third week of August uh, in, in, the, in your landscapes. And that's, that was the earliest one uh, in the study. The latest one, third week of uh, October, which is generally about two weeks past our first frost. And uh, if you look at this one, it did come very late in flower, and it only showed 28 days in bloom. But I think if you take that plant and put it in St. George area, where it's from, that you'd see a lot longer bloom period than 28 days. Uh, and so you're probably saying, well, what about the, those red ones? I, those uh, red pigmentation in, areogonum, in areogonums in general uh, can come at the end of the bloom period where the margins will start to turn red like you see here. And eventually a lot of them can turn almost solid red. You see this not only in corymbosum, but you see this in ovalifolium as well as umbilatum and probably other areogonum species. What I'm really looking at uh, doesn't show up very, very well here, but this is a very pink plant and it looks like this from almost day one. This has nothing to do with the bleeding of the red into the margins later on. And it's uh, associated with usually the veins and the uh, tepal portion of the, uh, or the petal portion of the tepal uh, generally will turn red on some, as well as the uh, calyx portion of the tepal will also turn red, giving the whole flower kind of a pinkish tinge. And I find that very attractive. And, uh, but it should be noted that in any given population, red is not consistent. And so it does not breed true to seed. So uh, one plant might be pure white. The one next to it in the same population could be the same color of red. And so this is something I'd like to get to the bottom of. Um, here you can see a little closer view of that. Of, uh, this, 
Okay. okay, this is the uh, plant in its native habitat. This is a uh, hell's backbone. It's one of my favorite species. And this is what the same species in, or variety in the common garden. And uh, it still remains one of my, my favorite plants. Um, I noticed uh, in the common garden that some of the flowers just didn't look the same as others. And so this is what the stamens or the anthers and the filaments look like on a normal flower. You can see it's about to be his its pollen. Uh, these top ones are normal flowers in different stages of development. I started noticing that some of the stamens, the filaments, were not extending out past the petals and that the anthers looked shriveled up. And I attribute, I call, I'm calling this male sterility. I do not know if it's environmental, uh, genetic, or cytoplasmic, but I've certainly observed it both in the common garden and in nature. When I talked to James Reville, who is the expert on all areogonums, uh, this is something that he had not seen in areogonum corbosum. And, uh, I'm just speculating. I'm, I'm wondering if his collections were done quite a while ago, whether this might be an environmental effect, since it's just more recent. Here again, a normal flower and a, a male sterile flower. This one, you can see the uh, stigma and style are kind of looking a little deformed there as well, whereas this one that does have the male sterile um, stamens in it, but the stigma and style look like they're quite viable, and I have collected good seed off of uh, male sterile plants. And when, a, when I um, look at these plants over the year, if, if it's male sterile one year, it's male sterile the next. It doesn't change back and forth. So what do I do with all this data? I wanted to take it and put it into principal component analysis, but since I'm looking at both qualitative and quantitative characteristics, this um, is problematic. But I found that you can put it into what is known as a multidimensional preference analysis, which is a principal component analysis with the ability to transform the data. And so that's what I did. And uh, you can see this first two principal components. We're looking at the second one, almost 20% of the variance. And the first one, 35 percent of the variance. So on the first two, we're looking at over 50 percent of the variability in the species. I determined that there were five principal components that I needed to look at, and they accounted for about 95 percent of the uh, variance that we saw. Uh, what this is showing are the numbers are my accessions, and these arrows are the principal components projected into this graph. They're not using the same uh, scale, uh, but they are, um, um, their length does matter. And so what we're seeing here, um, the height of the plant, the species 149, this is the Areogonum thompsonii again, has a high loading for height. And so basically what that's saying is this is the taller plants, or these are the, low, the, sm the shorter plants over here. Um, and so um, we start looking at this, and we can see this 150 down here, this variety here, and that is the uh, glutinosum, the bright yellow flowered uh, species. And it stands out as, as being very different. And that in ornamental horticulture is a selling point. And so I started looking at, at uh, the differences as, as maybe a way to um, determine the value of these plants as an ornamental. And uh, when you take away the arrows, this is kind of what you get. You've got Areogonum corymbosum corymbosum, or these species here. It could be argued that 523 is not. Uh, we have Smithii standing alone here in the center. Orbiculatum alone. Uh, these are the yet unidentified varieties still kind of hanging together. Uh, the glutinosum down here in the bottom. Uh, Areogonum thompsonii and Areogonum corymbosum aureum down here. And it turns out that we found through Mark Ellis's, the Mark Ellis found that uh, Areogonum thompsonii 
and Ariagonum nilesii, which he studied, are most likely the parents of, of the uh, of Arium. So I think that's pretty interesting. And so I love them all, and um, it's very hard to still. I, I, there has this kind of gives some credence, some science behind it. So it's not just well, this is the cutest one. I'm going with that. Um, but this is the cutest one. Yeah.